Introduction to Quantum Information Processing. Welcome to Lecture 13. In this lecture, I will show you a proof that Grover's search algorithm, which I explained in the previous lecture, is optimal in terms of the number of black box queries that it makes. I am going to show you a sketch of a proof of this theorem that any search algorithm which succeeds with probability three quarters must make order square root two to the n queries to the black box where n is the number of bits that the function acts on. I will make some simplifying assumptions. First, I'll assume that the function is always queried in the phase, like with Grover's algorithm. Second, I'll assume that the algorithm uses only n qubits, that is, no ancillary qubits are used. The purpose of these simplifying assumptions is to reduce clutter. It is very straightforward to adjust the proof that I will give to the general case where the query gates are of the form given in the previous lecture and where the quantum algorithm is allowed to use ancilla qubits. The more general proof will be just a cluttered up version of the proof that I'm about to explain. Nothing of importance is being swept under the rug in this simplified proof. So any quantum algorithm that makes k queries can be assumed to be of this form. The initial state of each of the n qubits is ket0. But then an arbitrary unitary operation u sub 0 is applied, which can create any pure state as the input to the first query. Then the first f query is performed. Then an arbitrary unitary operation u1 is applied. Then the second f query is performed. And so on up to the kth f query, followed by an arbitrary unitary operation, uk. The quantum algorithm is the specification of the unitaries u0, u1, up to uk. The input to the algorithm is the black box for f, which is inserted into the k query gates. The output is the final state produced by the quantum circuit, possibly measured. The overall approach will be as follows. For every n-bit string r, define f sub r as the function that takes value 1 at point r and value 0 everywhere else. We'll show that for any algorithm that makes asymptotically fewer than square root 2 to the n queries, it performs badly for at least 1 f r. Assume that we have some k query algorithm, specified by u0, u1, up to uk. Suppose that we insert one of the functions, fr, into the query gate. Call the final state psi rk. The superscript r is because this state depends on which r is selected. The subscript k is to emphasize that k queries are made. Now, consider the exact same algorithm run with the identity operation in each query gate. Whenever the identity is substituted into a query gate, we'll call that a blank query. Let's call the final state produced by this psi r0. Although the superscript r is redundant for this state, because the state is not a function of r, it's harmless, and it will be convenient to keep the superscript r in our notation. The first circuit corresponds to the function fr. The second circuit corresponds to the zero function, which is a function that's zero everywhere. This is because the query gate for the zero function is the identity operation. What we are going to show is that for some n-bit string r, the Euclidean distance between psi k r and psi k zero is upper bounded by this expression, with k in the numerator 
and square root 2 to the n in the denominator. If k is asymptotically smaller than root 2 to the n, then the bound asymptotically approaches 0. If the Euclidean distance approaches 0, then the two states are not distinguishable in the limit. This implies that the algorithm cannot distinguish between fr and the zero function. Now, let's consider these two quantum circuits plus some intermediate circuits. The computation on top makes all k queries to f sub r, and recall that we denote the final state that it produces as psi r k. Next, consider a circuit where the identity is performed in the first query, and then the remaining k minus 1 queries are made to fr. Call the final state that this produces psi r k minus 1. Next, consider a circuit where the identity is performed in place of the first two queries, and then the remaining k minus 2 queries are made to fr. Call the final state that this produces psi r k minus 2. So this circuit makes two blank queries and then k minus 2 queries to r. We can of course continue this sequence with more and more blanks at the beginning until we reach the final circuit that consists entirely of blanks in the queries. Recall that our goal is to show that the Euclidean distance between psi r k and psi r zero is small. Notice that we can express the difference between these states as the sum of differences between consecutive states in the above sequence. It's a telescoping sum where all the intermediate terms cancel out. This equation permits us to express the Euclidean distance between psi r k and psi r zero as a sum of Euclidean distances between consecutive states in the above sequence. Next, we'll analyze the Euclidean distance between two consecutive states. To understand the Euclidean distance between two consecutive states, we look at the corresponding circuits. Consider the circuit that performs k minus i blanks followed by i queries. The final state that it produces is psi r i. Now, Consider the circuit that performs k minus i plus 1 blanks followed by i minus 1 queries. The final state that it produces is psi r i minus 1. What can we say about the Euclidean distance between psi r i and psi r i minus 1? Notice that both computations are identical for the first k minus i blank queries. Let the state right after u sub k minus i be this superposition, where the amplitude of ket x is alpha sub x. But the amplitude alpha sub x has an additional subscript i to indicate that this is the state after k minus i blanks. These states are perfectly well defined for each i between 1 and k and they do not depend on r. It's interesting to consider what happens to this state at the next step. For the bottom computation, nothing happens to this state since the identity is performed in the query. For the top computation, a query to f sub r is performed. Since fr takes value 1 only at the point r, the fr query in the phase negates the amplitude of ket r, and it has no effect on the other amplitudes of the state. The difference between these two states is only in the amplitude of ket r. In each of these two states, the amplitude of ket r is the negation of that amplitude for the other state. This means that the Euclidean distance between the two states is two times the absolute value of alpha i r. Okay, 
Now let's look at what the rest of these circuits do. Notice that they both perform the same unitary. Since unitary operations preserve Euclidean distances, this means that the Euclidean distance between the two final states, psi ri and psi ri minus 1, is also 2 times the absolute value of alpha ir. And this holds for every i between 1 and k. Now let's put things together. Consider the average Euclidean distance between psi rk and psi r0 averaged over all n-bit strings r. As we saw earlier, we can bound each of these Euclidean distances by sums of Euclidean distances between consecutive pairs of our intermediate circuits. And by what we've just seen in the previous slide, we can express each of these as two times the absolute value of alpha ir, where these are the amplitudes of the states that occur after k minus i blank queries. We can change the order of the summations, like so. Now, let's look at what's inside the parentheses. It's the one norm of the quantum state with amplitudes alpha i r. Since for each i, these are the amplitudes of a quantum state, its two norm is one. It's a unit vector. But the one norm can be larger than the two norm. How much larger? By the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, the maximum possible one norm is the square root of the dimension, which is the square root of 2 to the n in this case. And this simplifies to the following expression. Since we've shown that an average of Euclidean distances is bounded by this expression, there must exist an r for which the Euclidean distance is less than or equal to this amount. Since the denominator is square root 2 to the n, and the numerator is 2k, it must be the case that k is proportional to the square root of 2 to the n in order for this Euclidean distance to be at least a constant. And the Euclidean distance has to be a constant if the algorithm distinguishes between fr and the zero function with probability 3 quarters. This completes the proof that the number of queries k is of order square root 2 to the n. Okay, let's end this lecture now.